you know, I was, I was one of a number of people back in the mid-1990s who were there uh, kind of at the beginning of this, and, and I had a, a certain role um, in writing some of the early anti-Monsanto stuff, um, co-organizing crop destruction activities and office occupation of Monsanto, some of those things. I uh, it's, put on record exactly what I did. Uh, there's a lot of people even to this day who don't want to speak publicly about what they did, uh, which complicates things somewhat. But um, I did enough to give me a responsibility to try and correct some of the misconceptions that we were, that I personally was involved in promoting, and some of the damage that I think I and others did to the standing of science in general um, on, on biotechnology in particular, um, and also to then try and make use of the potential that this technology does give us for improving environmental outcomes and improving food security in the world. So it's not as if we could just give up on this technology and forget about it and everything would be the same. Actually, you've got to think about potential benefits foregone when you do that. People talk about the precautionary principle, but there's an opposite side to that. That if you don't do something, then potentially you're not solving a problem in an important way. And that, that for me is what's, what's really interesting. Well, I had a highly unscientific educational training. Um, I studied history and politics at university level. I kind of gave up science when I was 16 because I was hopeless at maths and I just, even though I've always been interested in science, it just, I just knew that wasn't going to be my career. And you have to choose at a fairly early age in the UK system which path you're going to be on and you can never then go back because um, you mm -hmm. don't have the basic training. I can't go and do a PhD and become a scientist now because I didn't do that, that basic early stuff. So um, You could it, hear. You could yeah, hear. but it's very, so it, it actually very is, it's very life-defining at quite an early age. And, um, and I, so I lacked that whole area of my intellectual upbringing, if you like. And I didn't get back to it until I started writing books on climate change and l really learning for myself from first principles how science worked and why it was an important way of understanding the world. Because as an environmentalist, I already knew I was concerned about climate change because it was human impact on the environment and it was it fitted into that kind of frame. Um, but to explain it to other people and to say why it was important, I had to invoke the, the, the scientific information and the data underpinning that in, in support of the anecdotes and the ways of making it uh, uh, understandable to people through popular science. And so that, that was what brought me to, to science. As a, and it was an... A, to say it was an epiphany would be an understatement. You know, it was a complete revolution in my understanding of the world. Um, and it's, it's still going on all the time as I discover new things and as I'm continually reminded about what science is good at. Because there's a lot of people out there who, who misunderstand um, what science is. They think that it's, some, it's, it's kind of truth and it's then immutable and it's always going to be like that. But the point about science in many ways is that it's organized skepticism. That, and you see this with scientists, they're constantly attacking each other. The idea that scientists could somehow be corralled into, uh, into a kind of conspiracy, whether it's GMO or climate change or however these things are seen, is absurd. It's like herding cats. I mean, scientists love to undermine each other's work. Well, in, um, fact, in fact, the ones that win the Nobel Prizes and that have the highest acclaim are the ones that prove the prevailing paradigms wrong. Right. If, so if you, if, you could, if you could say, if you could show, demonstrate convincingly that there was a serious human impact from some of the GMOs which are out there, you'd get on the front cover of Nature or Science in a, in a heartbeat. If you had the real data, I mean, it, it's kind of implausible given what we know, but who, you know, it, it's possible. If you could do that with data, it absolutely would be out there. there would, there's no question this would be a, an important revelation. But, but it has to be done scientifically. So it has to be believable, it has to be the data, you have to double check, triple check, uh, and so on and so forth. Th this is the difference between activism and science. The activist, or the romantic, if you will, is going to say the same thing tomorrow that they say today. The scientist, I'm, I'm a scientist, I could say I believe something different tomorrow than I believe today if new data appear or if we have a better way to measure something and our understanding of a natural system changes. Our understanding of biology therefore changes. So science intrinsically is a changing, it's the process of changing your understanding. You know, activism, when you hear an opinion, as a scientist, you always question what, what is the reason for the opinion? So I don't want to single out 
you know, radical environmental activists because there are activists on all issues. There are activists, uh, you, you know, a, a, a pick an issue, there's an activist component. Um, as a scientist, when I hear a strong viewpoint that, that goes counter to what I believe the data actually say, it's actually kind of a wake up, um, even if it's coming from the activist perspective. I still question everything that we do. And there's the possibility that the activists are right on everything. There's that possibility. The data do not support that possibility. But science cannot rule out anything. That's the nature of science. And so when you hear very strong opinions, as you frequently hear in the environmental camps, uh, it's really a reminder, if I say something, it better be science-based, and there better be data and well-reasoned arguments that are supported by the data, or stay quiet until you understand. Almost none of it is rational, actually. In any, in any meaningful sense, because most of the things that are objected to are either not true, were already happening. I mean, even herbicide tolerance was already happening. It's, that's it was that happening with, with, with conventional precisely, uses precisely, of but there, so, so herbicides. Th there's very little there which is uh, rational in terms of the concerns which are commonly expressed. And I suppose, um, I mean, certainly, potentially, you could, you could create a, 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 through genetic modification, you could create a dangerous food stuff, you could create a dangerous seed which expressed a protein which was allergenic or, or, or toxic or something else. There's no, no just, I don't think any scientist would dispute that. So you have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis and it's irrational to say I'm against an entire process for crop breeding or, or, or for modifying um, um, DNA of, of living organisms because we've, that's, humans have been doing that since the dawn of time or since at least since we started um, domesticating plants and animals for our own consumption. Uh, we're, just, we're, sim we're continuing that, but we're continuing it in a much more precise way with an intervention in the genome which we actually understand as opposed to it being purely trial and error. So even that level isn't, isn't, <laughs> isn't rational. But, you know, let's not, let's, none, none of us would say that this isn't a, an area which should be closely regulated and where we have to be continually aware of potential safety implications, just as we do whenever we're talking about the human food supply. Yeah. One of the things that's a bit frustrating as a scientist is the real benefits that have accrued. There are risks with everything, including all of our current and future GM crops. There are risks. There are risks with all conventional crops as well. Uh, but let's just stop and recognize real benefits that have accrued. In the case of BT crops, particularly things like BT cotton, which had heavy, heavy intensive synthetic pesticide application, well documented reductions in use of synthetic pesticides. In the case of herbicide resistant crops, one of the uh, benefits that was a real surprise was that fertility increases, water retention in the soil increases. And the reason for that is because the technology allows you to do farming without having to plow. And the reason that plowing is done in a conventional field after soybeans is to do weed control, for example. If you don't need to do the plowing for weed control and you keep the residue left over at the end of the field on the ground, fertility increases, water retention increases, the amount of carbon stored in the soil goes up. Hmm. Although that wasn't the idea. The idea that was simply idea, to make exactly. weed control <laughs> easier and cheaper for farmers. Turns out, and th this is scientifically documented and there are long-term uh, agriculture ecological studies that are documenting real benefits that were unexpected as you say. That's a bit frustrating that those aren't factored into the broader discussion, certainly not factored in to the level that they should be. The I I irrational claim that most concerns me is the, the essence of the anti-GMO case being a conspiracy theory because really at heart 
the suggestion is that hundreds of independent scientists, you get this as well, being close, based geographically close to Monsanto. I've seen tweets already today that Danforth Center is just a front group for Monsanto. Uh, you know, that's presumably a conspiracy then involving hundreds of people here at this center. The, f the food and agriculture regulators in so many different countries, the United Nations, uh, scientific and academic aid institutions around the world, all are presumed to be in some kind of nefarious alliance with each other to assist these big corporations in taking over the world's food supply and poisoning us all as if they are somehow, you know, it, it, you can't get much more implausible than that. I think it's, it's much less likely than us not having gone to the moon, you know, or some of the other conspiracy theories that are out there, but it's widely believed by millions, probably tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of people, and that's the basis of the anti-GMO case. Yeah, there's a lot of examples like that. There's also you know, you can take it to the extreme, to the ridiculous, and I don't worry too much about the really crazy things. And you hear it all the time. I was watching CNN, I don't know, six months ago, and Cindy Lauper was on it, the Girls Just Want to Have Fun artist. And she was ranting about how it's just awful that our tomatoes all have uh, pieces of fish genes in them. You know, and our tomatoes, they don't taste very good today because they're these hybrids between fish and tomatoes. So I think those she are the... She actually said that on TV. Yeah, and the well. interviewer nodded politely, <laughs> unquestioned. Um, so the ridiculous, the crazy no, the stuff... The basis can, of that myth can... was the Arctic flounder gene that's right, going for into... That's right, antifreeze. That's right. That's right. Which was never actually no. brought into widespread use. That's right. No. Global, global food shortages and... Uh, improving the environment in and around agriculture. Two, mm -hmm. two big outcomes that we want to have science have in agriculture. Food that's abundant and nutritious, but also agriculture that doesn't destroy the environment. Right, I mean, we, we have pretty hardwired ecological constraints now facing humanity, which we probably didn't have decades ago. Um, f first and foremost, we've got climate change, which is going to be altering um, weather patterns, increasing droughts, changing the thermal tolerance of crops is going to be important here because it's simply going to be too hot in some places to grow crops which are currently very productive. Um, and then we've got to do produce double the amount of food we've got at the moment on the same amount of land. And you can only do that through improve, improving productivity, through using land more efficiently and also using water more efficiently. So how are you going to do that? Well, you, you, you probably need to work on the genomes of the crops in order to make them more water efficient and to make them more productive and, and higher yielding, and to do so within the context of reducing and ultimately eliminating the worst agrochemicals which are currently used in production. You know, we've got dead zones, we've got nitrogen overuse, fertilizer pollution, all of these things have to be addressed and they, most of them can be addressed um, you, in, in the biology of the crops themselves. If you ask the average person in the supermarket, for example, uh, what, how did your food get here? How did it get on the shelf? How did those, you know, that box of cereal, where did the grain come from to make it? I think uh, the science that goes into agriculture is largely underappreciated, and I'm not talking about GM type technology and GM science. I'm talking about all the breeding and all of the other aspects of producing improved varieties that yield more or that are drought resistant, most of those properties are conventionally bred traits. But to do that, scientists are incorporating and integrating billions of bits of information. So breeding a new tomato, for example, is really a collaboration between breeders, plant scientists, mathematicians, computer scientists, just because it's a technology intensive area. The science behind genetic modification, by comparison, is actually quite simple. Yeah. Although there's, there's some things you can't do. Like I, I would really like to have a, a, a potato and a tomato variety which is resistant to blight. Blight mm -hmm. is a big problem in the UK. I grow yeah. tomatoes, sorry, tomatoes. Um, uh, and I, I don't think you can do that without using transgenic technology, yeah. um, not least because the, the fungus evolves so rapidly. So right, by the time you're taking your 20 years to do it conventionally, it's probably evolved resistance. Well, there's actually a couple of problems with uh, breeding 
Phytophthora, or blight-resistant potatoes. One is uh, the potatoes, at least in the United States, are all a single type of variety, Russet Burbank potato. And there's a single variety because McDonald's and Burger King demands a very specific variety, but it's very susceptible to this blight pathogen. And the way it's controlled is with 8 to 12 fungicide applications per growing cycle. Oh, it's more, it's more than actually. We, 15, up to 15, so one per week of the growing season. You know, we have a yeah. mutual friend who yeah. works on this problem at the Sainsbury Laboratory, Jonathan Jones. Uh, he's developed some lines, some improved varieties of potato, that take one gene from wild relatives that are resistant to the blight, and you can turn that very susceptible variety into a highly resistant variety that needs very few fungicide applications. You can do that by moving one gene from one potato to another, and you can preserve all of these characteristics that the consumer demands. This is an example of one of these benefits that are probably underappreciated by the general public. The technology has the not only the promise, but the actual practice, we've seen this with BT traits, of lowering synthetic pesticide and fungicide and other, other pesticide mm -hmm. applications. And one, one of the things, sorry to carry on, but one of the things they're doing here, which I was lucky enough to hold in my hands a uh, cassava, which has been, which is transgenic and resistant to the brown street virus. Um, now this is spreading across from East Africa and it's potentially a serious threat to food security because cassava is an important staple crop for a lot of people in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it would be very difficult. And would it be impossible to engineer this in um, through conventional breeding, this virus resistant? Because basically you've, t you've taken a fragment of DNA from the virus, you put it in the plant, and that's what's compelling the, mm -hmm. the resistance. Mm -hmm. Is there any way you could do that using conventional breeding? Yeah, uh, that's another very good example. This is a case where we're immunizing plants with just a little piece of... DNA, doesn't code for a protein, there's no concerns with allergens or anything like that. But what we're really doing when we make the virus resistant plants, we're simply immunizing using a natural mechanism. The reason we can't conventionally breed that trait into cassava is there are no good natural variants that are resistant to this particular virus. There are natural, there are in use varieties of cassava that are resistant to other varieties, uh, other viruses. And in those cases, uh, we try to get the breeders, and the breeders know to try to integrate those in through conventional means. So this is a good example where, where uh, just adding a single piece of DNA can create a trait that doesn't exist, but is absolutely essential if we want to preserve cassava in sub-Saharan Africa.